touch the pad and the little red light goes on and you hold the pad, that means it, it is working and you should do that when you ask the question. Otherwise, Jennifer will uh, she has a little slingshot and she'll shoot something at you. Uh, if the microphone doesn't work, uh, Oprah, I mean Chris Monsier, has uh, this wireless mic typically that he will be passing around during the question time. Because we do want the online participants and people who watch this archived or listen to the podcast to be able to hear your question because you all know how annoying that is if you can't hear the question. So I think that's, those are all the kind of recurring little things. Um, Seems like the most challenging thing in this class is getting that sign-in sheet back to me at the end. So that's your objective is to make sure after everyone signs in, get it back to me. So is there a student who would like to volunteer to do that each week? <laughs> Anyone? It just needs to. John. John's going to do that. So okay. John Horowitz will bring back the questions. That will be great. Is that a relative of the other Horowitz? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. So I think, uh, are there any questions? So we're going to give our... I was going to introduce you, Rob. All right. Are we on? We're on. Okay. Great. So welcome, um, everyone, to the uh, Friday Center for Transportation Studies um, seminar. And this is a significant milestone in the history of the seminar. It is our 200th seminar. And uh, to help celebrate that, we've done a couple things. First of all, we've asked Professor Robert Bertini here to speak because he is really the person that got the seminar going and has um, sort of made it what it is today. And, and I don't think we'd have 200 if it wasn't for his leadership um, and efforts early on. And it's really become, I think, uh, a really great thing that happens at PSU and a great resource for our students, for the community, and the world out there on the web. Uh, so it's really exciting to celebrate 200 of them, um, many of which are on the web, so you can go back and watch um, many of them on the web if, if you've missed them. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe we should have a contest who has actually seen the most of them in person. But um, So uh, I said we were doing two things to celebrate that. One was inviting Professor Bertini here to speak on the 200th occasion. And then afterwards, uh, we have some refreshments to celebrate the 200th uh, seminar. So if you have time to stick around afterwards in the hallway area, we have some uh, homemade cupcakes and um, sparkling cider. So stick around. Those of you on the web, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we don't have a way to electronically transmit. How far back does this go? Does the I'll say something about it at yes. the end. Okay. okay. He's more the historian on this. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. I haven't said anything about his uh, Topic. He, uh, in case you didn't know, uh, Professor Bertini is a faculty member in civil and environmental engineering and urban studies and planning, and directs um, OTREC, the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium, um, and also the ITS Lab, and is going to talk about some of his research. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thanks everyone. The top, the title today is Travel Time Estimation for Traffic Management and Traveler Information, and I've thrown some visuals on the screen that show that travel time is an important parameter that is reported around the world. Uh, there are some international examples. What's interesting, if you notice, is the travel time is usually expressed in an Arabic number. So even if you're in Japan or China um, or even uh, the <coughs> Middle East or Europe, uh, you're seeing travel time as numbers. So I thought that was kind of an interesting way to start. Uh, we also have some travel time that we report in Portland. That's just an illustration of um, a, a variable message sign on Interstate 5. And today, here we go. I have a few objectives. I wanted to start off with some travel time visualizations and some travel time fundamentals. And it turns out that, that, that I and we, more collectively here at PSU, have been involved in a lot of research related to travel time. And as I've thought about it, I think anyone involved in transportation research, all of my colleagues here, for them, travel time is an important parameter that figures into all of their research, whether it's John Glebe's uh, travel demand forecasting or Jennifer's travel behavior research or Miguel's uh, freight-related research, Chris Monsier's uh, research as well, Jim Strathman, Tony Ruffalo. Everyone is using travel time as a fundamental parameter. So I was realizing that it's pretty important, and I thought I would do a bit of a review of what we've been doing. Um, what a lot of the research that we've done in, uh, in the last few years has, has led to is the need to think about how do we actually measure travel time. And so 
uh, along with a colleague at the University of Maryland, we developed a framework for determining how um, many sensors you should place on a freeway as a case study, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, and describe that analytical tool. Talk a minute about future research and then close with some thoughts about these uh, past uh, 200 seminars. Travel time is fundamental. It can be used to generate other things. Sometimes it itself is generated from other things, which I'll show you. Um, travel time is multimodal, so travel time comparisons between modes uh, can often be used to encourage people to use one particular mode over the other or to choose the mode or the route uh, on a network that is most advantageous for them. Um, you can measure it, you can guess it, you can report it, you can predict it, you can forecast it. Uh, a lot of us in transportation are trying to do some or all of those things. Sometimes we do them be uh, better than uh, other times. Um, if I get it wrong, so there is, so it is, this isn't just an academic exercise, that there, there is a, a um, problem, I guess you could say, if, if we get it wrong. We can annoy travelers if we tell them it's going to take an hour to get uh, from here to the Columbia River and it takes them five hours. A question that'll come up later is if we tell them it'll take an hour, but it takes them ten minutes, does that annoy them? So th I'll hold that till later. Um, by being wrong, we can destroy users' confidence in the system. Um, we can actually increase congestion by causing people to do the wrong thing, to go the wrong way. Um, all of those things then have the, the side effects of uh, uh, causing safety problems, air quality problems, fuel consumption increasing our carbon footprint and all those um, important uh, elements um, of transportation. So as transportation engineers and planners, which many or maybe all of you are, um, we as uh, practitioners and researchers can have an impact on travel time. We can certainly do things that cause it to increase or hopefully in some cases we can actually do something that causes it to decrease, which is often the objective of a, of a classical transportation planning project. Um, when I study transportation planning, you build something, you widen something. That the the uh, largest component of the benefit of that improvement is the savings in user time, user cost, uh, due to decreasing the travel time. More and more recently, we've been talking about and trying to understand the, how the variability of travel time affects users, and trying to figure out if we can quantify the cost of a change in variability. So making um, a trip more variable from day to day, so your average might be 10 minutes, but your standard deviation may be very large. Is there a cost to that? We think there is, or we actually know there is, uh, especially for shippers and people who need to be, um, people who themselves need to be at work on time uh, or to childcare or, or, or what have you. Um, travel time or actions that we take can also affect the comparisons between modes, so improving one mode can um, in improve that particular mode's success and affect how you compare one mode to the other. So a friend of mine, uh, Hans van Lint from uh, the Technical University of Delft, his uh, dissertation was on freeway travel time, um, and he had this quote on the title page, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And that, I think that's a, a true quote, but it just makes me think that a lot of what we do is very difficult, and oftentimes, uh, it's so difficult we never go back and figure out whether we did it right or not. So I would like to, to not have this as a cloud over our discussion here today, but more of a, of a challenge and encouragement to improve the way we do things. I wanted to walk through a couple visualizations. I'm really into visualizations. I think they're a very useful tool for understanding data, and that's really what my research is all about. And I try in my classes to get students to think about how to visualize some sort of problem before doing some sort of statistical analysis. And these are just some quick little examples. This is something that uh, was done at Metro that is a forecast of travel times in minutes from the Be Beaverton Regional Center. So they've color-coded green is five minutes and red is uh, 45 minutes and greater. So for any point on the, on the network in their travel demand model, you can develop these um, travel time contours. So that's, that's something that's typically done with travel time. The London Underground, some of you may have written on that. Uh, I think it's one of the things that got me interested in transportation many years ago when I visited London. And this is just the London Underground map with travel time. You can't see it, but it's shown in minutes on the map, and it was just added to the uh, pre-existing map that is available um, in London or on the web. 
And then somebody else basically redrew the map, stretching it out so that the uh, lengths of each segment are proportional to the travel time, which is kind of an interesting change to the way that map looks. And then for one particular station, the Elephant and Castle Station, this just shows travel time in um, kind of travel time contours shown around that station, which I thought was another interesting way to look at that map. Well, other, other things other than rail vehicles have travel time. In this case, the, the terrible tsunami in 2004. Um, this is the wave travel time in hours. Um, earthquakes have the same thing. Water uh, after a storm in, in a, a watershed has travel time, and this shows just a very similar uh, plot of uh, water travel time. When I was a kid, I was involved in the campaign to build a second fire station in my town, and so this just shows for a city these days with GIS, which we didn't have back in 1974. Uh, they can show fire station response time from the existing fire station and show the contours of the areas that are not well served more than six minutes uh, by the existing fire station. Um, <coughs> this is <coughs> from the New York Times. Similar to the London map, I think they were inspired by that. This is the commuter rail system in New York. And actually, I, I didn't put the TriMet uh, rail map in here, but they on their map, they do have travel time shown. This was kind of interesting uh, from Cambridge in England. It shows train journey times as uh, contours from that particular station. So you could pick any station um, and then do the same thing. And this was interesting because it hits to the multimodal aspect. It compares travel time by train and by car from Cambridge. So it shows the difference in travel time um, where red shows the locations for which it would be, I believe, faster to take the train than to drive. So with some of those visualizations in mind, I always like to start with fundamentals. And so what I'm going to show you a lot in the next few minutes is a time-space diagram, time on the x-axis, distance on the y-axis. Some of you have seen this before. Some of you probably have nightmares about it, but uh, others this may, you may have seen it, but you may not have it burned into your brain like some of my students. So travel time is usually something we're measuring horizontally on such a diagram. So I can plot on here a trajectory of a vehicle which basically maps in space and time the progress of a vehicle or a person walking um, over the time-space plane. So for this distance that we're, we're looking at here, the travel time is simply the width of the x-axis. And you can see a lot of little details about the path of that vehicle. Um, you can see that it's accelerating and decelerating. Fortunately for us, the units work out so that the slope of any uh, uh, line on this plane is the speed. And you can work that out from elementary school math, I think. Uh, rate times time equals distance. So the slope, fortunately on a time-space diagram, is the speed. And so we can just look at that wiggly line and see, well, as the slope is increasing, the, ve the vehicle or the person is accelerating. As it flattens off, they are decelerating. So we can learn a lot. And actually, we know everything we need to know from a traffic management standpoint about the progress of a vehicle if we have its trajectory on a time-space diagram. A lot of times, we don't have that much detail. So we can approximate. And I'll show you how that works. A couple other definitions. Uh, if we know over a particular distance what the free flow travel time is, we could plot a hypothetical trajectory of, of the yellow line there of a vehicle traveling at its free flow speed or taking its free flow travel time to traverse that distance. And so the difference between the actual travel time by the green trajectory and the yellow, the uh, hypothetical free flow travel time, is what we call delay. So there's a very particular definition to that word delay. We use it kind of like we use Kleenex as a generic term. But in traffic, delay means the difference between actual travel time and free flow travel time. And you can show that right on the time-space diagram. Now, oftentimes, and I'll be showing you some results with some detector data in a little bit, but oftentimes we might have some kind of detector in the middle of a, a road segment uh, or even a track segment for a rail line. So we are, are involved in measuring things usually at specific points. And so what, what can we do with information from one point? Well, we can measure that speed at that detector and then extrapolate it over the whole section. And that's a very common thing to do. 
as I've shown with the green line, I've simply ex extrapolated the speed that I measured at the detector over the whole segment. And how did I do? Was I accurate? So it's going to be a little bit off because you don't really know what the vehicle is doing. I mean, if the vehicle is completely stopped and then accelerates over the detector and then stops again, you're going to be way off. But this is a kind of an example that on average, you're able to do fairly well by extrapolating a point measurement over a distance. Of course, it depends how long that distance is. If you have one detector on a 100-mile facility, it's not going to help you too much. But if your section is, say, a quarter of a mile, third of a mile on a freeway, sometimes that can be sufficient. More on that later. Uh, this, this, just uh, as an illustration, um, is how you can take those extrapolations from many detectors and add them together to calculate a link travel time. So if you have, in this case, four detectors, you simply take those extrapolated travel times, add them together for your overall link. Now, if you have two detectors, there's a little bit, there's a slight variation. You can measure speed at two points and then kind of extrapolate them backwards and forwards until they intersect, and then that is your assumed trajectory and that is your assumed travel time. And so that's something one of my friends, Ben Koisman at, at Ohio State, has been using a similar method to improve travel time calculations on freeways. A little bit more about measurements. There are lots of ways to measure um, traffic parameters. You can simply have a watch and you can be traveling. You can be walking or biking or riding the bus or driving. and maybe having a partner with a stopwatch, a simple stopwatch method to measure uh, travel time between two fixed locations. You can use detectors of any kind, like I just showed you, and there are many, many <coughs> different kinds of detectors. <coughs> you can also use radio frequency toll tags, and so in places that have tolling, um, they're able to use as a byproduct of having the toll system in place and having vehicles with toll tags in them. They can simply record the vehicle's arrival at fixed locations based on identifying them from their tag and then report travel time for many vehicles and come up with very good estimates of current travel time. In, in the radio frequency world, there are also things called signposts that are often used in fleet management. Um, the, the bus system in Seattle has a signpost system where there are some fixed stations that are waiting for the bus, buses to pass by, and then those fixed stations detect the, the passage of a particular bus and identify it with its particular uh, route and schedule, and then they can determine whether the um, bus is early or late. And uh, Seattle's famous for their My Bus system that gives you, similar to the transit tracker here in Portland, uh, but using the signpost system, it gives you bus um, arrival information. Uh, so those are fixed locations. Also, you can have cameras that uh, are looking for license plates. And so if you have two cameras and you match the same license plate at two, two fixed locations, you can report that, uh, that license plate's travel time between those two points. And if it's connected to a vehicle, then that can give you something uh, useful. They're all, and I'll show you a quick example in a minute, but you can also count. We count things a lot in transportation, uh, any of you who have been in the field for a while, know that we count things. Sometimes we do it by hand, sometimes we do it automatically. Um, but you can uh, estimate travel time from traffic counts, which is something that's done quite frequently. So in contrast to fixed locations, there are also mechanisms that allow you to um, compute travel time from uh, measures that are made at fixed times, so not necessarily at fixed locations. So if you have a GPS device, that's connected to a wireless network, that device may be reporting your location every minute or every five minutes or every 10 minutes. Uh, on the TriMet buses, that's the system they use where periodically the bus is sending its location, not at fixed locations, usually at some fixed frequency. It doesn't have to be, but uh, certainly not at fixed location. Cellular phones are also things that, that if they're equipped with GPS, um, they're very similar. They can be reporting their time uh, either to the network or uh, a lot of times what we use for data collection is a GPS device that is simply writing its location in latitude and longitude every few seconds to a file. And then when we're done with our experiment, we download that data and we can learn a lot about uh, what that particular person or vehicle was doing over its trip. So there is a slight distinction between measurements at points and measurements uh, from mobile devices that are connected 
either wirelessly or have some sort of writing capability. Is everyone clear on that, those distinctions? So just a couple real elementary examples. So if you're taking measurements at fixed locations, X1 and X2, and you are standing by the side of the road, you can simply write down the time that the vehicle passes X1 is T1 and T2, and then you can draw the trajectory, which because you only have two points is a straight line. At fixed times, it's very similar. You're simply writing down the location, which is not fixed, um, at a fixed time interval. So then you're constructing the trajectory this way, uh, like that. Okay, and I mentioned that sometimes counts are used to um, compute travel time. This, some of you may be familiar with the Texas Transportation Institute Urban Mobility Report. It's a national study that's done just about every year. They skipped a year recently to improve their methodology. But what they do is they take traffic count data from all state by state, and in Oregon there are hundreds of places where traffic counts are made, you, sometimes on a continuous basis, but most often um, you might have a, a location where you're going to do a traffic count for 48 hours once every three years. So they'll have a, a database of traffic counts and then they will take this model that has been developed using national data where you have volume on the x-axis and speed on the y-axis and they will take the traffic count from that particular location, go up to the red curve and over to the left to obtain a peak hour speed and then for all that volume so you can convert a traffic volume with speed or travel time over a particular length of that segment into VMT, vehicle miles traveled. And so that is how the TTI method takes count data, obtains a speed, converts that to travel time, uh, and then converts it to VMT. And they do all kinds of things with, with those numbers. But uh, hopefully at some point someone did a study um, to come up with those blue points to make sure that, that this is a valid way to go. Uh, this just happens to be some data that we could pull off the freeway network here in Portland, um, flow versus speed. So actually, in a lot of places, we could actually probably improve TTI's estimates by giving them access to real uh, speed flow data to allow them to actually improve that conversion from counts to speed, or just give them um, real travel time measurements off of the facilities that we have. So um, in places where we have easy access to data, uh, that could be possible. So are travel times reported uh, in this part of the country? Uh, just a couple quick examples. WashDOT has an, an interesting website um, where you can pick an origin and a destination, and you can pick a, an arrival time, and you can, so it draws it on a map for you on the right-hand side there. And then you hit submit, and it says that your 95% reliable travel time is 24 minutes, and 95% of the time you would need to leave at 7.36 a.m. To, to leave by 8. So something is going on behind the scenes here with uh, the analysis of a lot of data. Now, speaking of data, uh, data collection used to be pretty difficult, and there is um, a guy named Greenshield who's pretty famous in our field, and we're actually having a symposium in his honor this summer um, with the Traffic Flow Theory Committee of the Transportation Research Board. So I have a couple of his documents from the 40s and 50s where they had very painstaking data collection methods. You can see a, a movie camera up on the top of the building on the upper left. You can see him with a, a camera here. That was from the 1930s uh, and one car on the road behind him. And then on the, on the right-hand side from the 50s, there was what I would call a speedometer. I don't know if, if they called it something else, but it was basically a speed log that took up the entire front seat of that uh, vehicle. Now we can do all this on a you know, cell phone-sized device, so he would probably be excited about all the data collection opportunities but they had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time to get a very small amount of data. And one of the themes um, that I've been, themes of my research and my interest in transportation is that now we're at the other end of the spectrum where we have so much data. It's like uh, my friend Carl Petty uh, has this little cartoon of a f guy with a fire hose. You know, we're being 
sprayed with so much data we don't know what to do with it, and the trick is how to manage it and how to, to use it intelligently. I mentioned some previous research. I was thinking back, and actually the first research project I worked on uh, back in 1995 involved the collection of travel time data from freeways in Los Angeles. Um, we were evaluating a freeway service patrol program in LA, and we connected, we collected over 3,500 travel time runs on Interstate 710. We didn't have real nice, uh, for some reason at that time, our, our presentation methods were fairly uh, ugly in, in terms of color, but uh, that was a few years ago. But uh, we did, um, I guess you could say that was my first experience with travel time data. When I first came to Portland State, one of our first projects with ODOT was to evaluate a system that they had in place there, a license plate recognition system. You can see up here there, and these may still be out there, I'm not sure, they're certainly not functioning, but there were some video cameras mounted on mast arms at three locations on Highway 18 um, between um, Grand Ronde and Lincoln City, so those three locations. And those cameras were uh, trying to identify license plates and trying to match them between those, those location pairs and report travel time. So we evaluated that by running some probe vehicles back and forth on Highway 18 and comparing those, um, the travel times actually experienced to those that were uh, measured by the license plate recognition system and uh, found that there, that there was some promise there, but th that by the time we got done, the system had, uh, yeah, the, in the field, had had some uh, technical problems, so uh, was no longer working. But we found that the concept was, was valid. And uh, I guess about four years ago, we started a project with ODOT where we were, um, which actually motivates what I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, the idea is that ODOT wants to display travel time messages on the variable message signs, as shown on the lower left. And so we did an initial project with them uh, covering the entire freeway system in Portland, as shown on the map on the right. We ran 87 probe vehicle runs, uh, collected about 15 hours of data, and then compared that travel time information, as we called it ground truth, to the travel times that would have been calculated by the system, and found that there, were some, there was some good agreement, but there was some, this just shows the probe travel time versus the calculated travel time using some different methods. And if it was an ideal world, all those points would lie on a straight line. And, but we found some variability because there were, there were issues with data quality, there were issues with the detector placement, uh, and just issues with the fact that it's difficult to estimate travel time when conditions are changing. So that was kind of phase one of the project. Uh, we also had some data from uh, buses. So there are several TriMet uh, bus routes that operate on I-5. And uh, we obtained about three weeks' worth of um, ground truth uh, trajectory data from the buses. So this shows um, these black lines are the trajectories of the buses traveling on I-5. And the background color is speed measured by detectors on I-5. So you can see as the freeway speeds start to drop, the bus speeds start to drop because their slopes are dropping. So we we tried to, or we did, compare the actual travel times of the buses to travel times that would have been calculated from the detectors. And again, this is the uh, just a quick summary plot showing the actual bus travel time versus what the detectors would have estimated. Um, so there are some, some issues with the fact that the, the buses are large and traveling a little more slowly on the freeway. But we think that the idea of having probes in the traffic stream um, is promising. Uh, so Kristen Tufty, I'm not sure if she's here. Oh, yes, she is. So this, I'm not really going to say anything about much more about this because that led into a project that Kristen has been working on with ODOT to t pinpoint locations and issues related to data quality, um, related to uh, being able to estimate travel time as conditions are changing. And so they more recently have collected 300 more um, runs, uh, travel time runs on I-5 and uh, Highway 217 as ground truth, and they're testing different algorithms. Um, and I think that project is, is going to continue uh, into the future. I think those were some results, but I'll skip. 
So now to the motivation of what I really want to talk about is there are ongoing efforts around the country and actually around the world to improve travel time estimation and travel time prediction. I've already tried to make the case that it's important and that we should be, it's, it's valuable to be thinking about this. Um, so one of the things that came up in my head was this little puzzle. Um, if you were going to design a system of sensors, for example, so that you could monitor the transportation network in such a way that you could reliably report travel time. If you had unlimited budget, unlimited resources to do this, what would you do? Would you put sensors everywhere? Would you put some sensors and put some probe vehicles? Um, I'll tell you now that I, I haven't answered that question yet, but we've started to answer the question of how much detection or how much monitoring do you need in order to reliably uh, report travel time information. Um, so th this was also motivated by um, phone calls and emails that I get from people who are designing new facilities and they say, well, we're designing a new toll road. This one of the cases was in Maryland. And so we're going to have toll tags. So we assume we don't need any sort of uh, fixed detection. And I said, well, I think you, you would want some, if you're going to be managing this facility and working with dynamic pricing to keep it functioning at a high level of service so that your users who are paying you to use it are getting a good experience, I think you want to have some basic monitoring. And then, of course, the question is, well, how much? So at what spacing should I place these sensors? And there isn't, there isn't a book you can go look up and say, well, here's the ideal um, detector configuration for my facility. In the case of Oregon, they were placed upstream of every on-ramp in order to uh, facilitate the ramp metering system. In other places, I would say arbitrary spacing um, decisions are made um, depending on the, on the state or the, the locale. So my goal here was to try to answer the question of what is the optimal detector spacing for travel time information provision. And so I'll ask you to bear with me as I walk you through that uh, thought process. Many of you may know that there are a lot of detectors on the freeway system in Portland. So the question might be, well, gosh, we've got over 500 detectors. Why can't we, uh, why can't we reliably uh, provide travel time information? And the, the quick answer to that is they just might not be at the right locations. So they were never placed for travel time monitoring. We have a lot of detectors which are very useful for the ramp metering system, for basic monitoring. Um, and this is one thing that Kristen Tufte is working on with her team. Where should we place additional detection um, here in the Portland region to improve travel time estimation? Uh, there are a couple places where you can get travel time information currently. Um, on, at TripCheck, there is uh, basically speed information shown in real time, 24 hours a day for the freeways. K2 uh, has a list of travel times, as far as I could find. And Traffic.com has this traffic hotspots um, kind of uh, takes the traffic temperature with a little slider bar here. Um, and certainly in many other, and then at three locations on three variable message time, travel time ranges are, are displayed. Um, and of course, many places around the world have travel time information that's displayed. In Melbourne, Australia, you can get a little, um, a little alert system for a particular freeway. You can get a, a real time, just a little digital number on your um, little PDA or on your desktop that uh, updates that little number so you can kind of monitor that as you're preparing uh, for your trip. Uh, another thing that we're doing in Portland, just, just as a little plug for this, is we're working beyond the freeways on the arterials also, so we um, are not forgetting about the arterials. So let me walk you through my, my um, effort to understand the impact of sensor spacing on travel time estimation. And I'm going to make you, uh, torture you again to have you think in the time-space plane, because the, the next few slides are going to be using that, that um, orientation again. So the x-axis is time, the y-axis is distance. And so I'm showing in green here a hypothetical trajectory of a vehicle over a hypothetical segment length. And I'm also showing its free flow speed uh, as the dashed line. So here is the free flow travel time. Here's the actual travel time. So the difference between the two is delay. 
And then I, I put on here something uh, similar to what I mentioned before, where if you measured that vehicle's speed at a point, and then you extrapolated its uh, trajectory, which would be the red, this would be its extrapolated travel time. And in this case, uh, the difference between the extrapolated and actual is this distance, which I call over prediction. So if I'm, the idea is I'm telling someone what their travel time is going to be up here, as, right as they enter the section. And then we evaluate, well, what was their actual travel time once they've traversed that section? And uh, if we overpredict, that's one thing. We can also underpredict, or we can get it right. And so one of the things I'm going to ask you for some input on is, is there a difference between overprediction and underprediction? Is or are they equally um, bad? So let's we're going to look at a little bit of a case study. This happens to be one day's data from Interstate 5 northbound. So this uh, from about um, 4 p.m. No, 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. Here we're down in Wilsonville. Here's the Columbia River Bridge. So this is the very familiar tubular curves um, congestion that occurs in the morning. This is the Columbia River Bridge congestion that occurs in the afternoon. And I've drawn some lines around these uh, congested shapes. And um, this is going to be a little bit of a lesson in traffic theory for some of you. But what I'm going to do is focus on I'm going to split this section up um, into one-mile sections. And I'm going to focus on a, on a kind of a hypothetical one-mile section of freeway and see if we can understand what would be the impact of either having one detector per that one mile or having more than one, so two, three, four, five detectors. So could we do a better job at, at our travel, esti travel time estimation? So of course, this could be you could pick any one-mile section. Uh, I just happened to pick this one because I thought it was interesting and something uh, that had a real application. So I'm just zooming in here a little bit. I'm going to use a traffic model um, that looks like a triangle. For those of you who are, we had some reviewers of this paper who were very worried about the traffic model that we assumed. But anyone could assume any traffic model. We just picked a triangular one bec because it's easy. And this is a uh, shockwave diagram that shows our, uh, it's a simplified uh, description of the congested conditions. So this pink area is congested and the green area is uncongested. And what I'm interested in are the transitions. So if you have ever been in a traffic stream where you're going along just fine, then all of a sudden you have to hit your brakes. Has anyone ever experienced that? So that is what we call a transition. And a lot of people go through a lot of those transitions in a day or in a life uh, who are dealing with traffic. And it turns out, and I'll show you, that the transition times are those that are most difficult uh, to estimate travel time because conditions in the section are changing. And you may not know that they've changed until some much later time just because of where your detector is placed. So that's the crux of the issue here. This was our, our traffic model. Um, and for most of you, the details here doesn't matter, don't matter, but for some of you, they do, because there'll be a test later um, for those of you who took my class last quarter back there. Um, and just for our reviewer who is really worried about it, this is some real data from I-5 on February 8, 2007, the day that we were analyzing. And it shows that our model was fairly reasonable um, given the actual data. So this is a flow density model. Now, I mentioned the word transition, and this uh, shows kind of a hypothetical um, time-space plane on a hypothetical freeway. It could be I-5. And the center area is an arbitrary congested regime. So obviously, traffic is not either perfectly congested or perfectly uncongested. It's fluctuating a little bit, but I'm trying to simplify the world by let's just say it's fairly consistent in those two regimes. So green is good, red is bad. And there are six different kinds of transitions. Um, there are ones that look horizontal on the time-space plane. So they're fixed in space. So like a traffic signal, stop bar is a stationary transition. There can be stationary transitions when there's an incident at a freeway or if there's a bottleneck. Um, then there are two backward-moving transitions. This one here is a backward forming 
transition, which means if a vehicle is traveling up this way, it's going to transition from uncongested to congested. And then this backward recovery uh, transition is the opposite, so you're moving along in congested uh, state, and then you're very excited to see a nice empty road ahead of you, and you get to accelerate. Um, those are, are two very interesting ones. And then there are two forward-forming kind, forward-moving um, transitions, a forward-forming transition and a forward-recovery transition. Sorry, those are the time-space uh, dimensions. So I'm going to say more about this in a minute. But if, if our world was restricted to this little portrait here, wh which was completely congested, so if our one-mile section that we're interested in is fully congested, we would be somewhere in that little square. And similarly, if, if our world was entirely uncongested, which sometimes we would like, then we would be, our portrait would, would be outside of this um, transition area. And if we then look at vehicle trajectories for, let's say, our one mile segment length, it's very easy to report travel time for vehicles in a completely uncongested state or a completely congested state. So. This detector is measuring all free flow conditions, so 60 miles per hour. So you tell every vehicle it, you're going to be traveling at 60 miles per hour over this section, and you're going to be correct every time if, if the state is completely freely flowing. And the same story over here. If the section is completely congested, you're going to tell someone, hey, it's congested. It's going to take you a little bit longer to get through the section, and you're going to be 100% correct every time. So for now, I'm going to set aside those two uh, states. If we're fully congested or fully uncongested, uh, that's pretty easy. So let's not worry about that right now. Let us uh, focus on the transitions, the forward and backward moving transitions. And actually, for today, I'm going to be focusing on the backward moving ones. And if you think about it, if I put a trajectory on here, I think I can put a trajectory on here. There we go. So that's just our old hypothetical trajectory from earlier. And you can see as the vehicle is moving through those backward moving ones, the, the transition is moving in the opposite direction. If the vehicles were, were moving through a forward forming or forward recovery transition, essentially the vehicle is moving with that transition. So the impact of those forward moving ones occurs over a very short time period. So we also set those aside for this analysis and focused our attention on these backward moving ones that take longer to pass through uh, our hypothetical one mile section and, and are touching more vehicles as they're passing through. If you want the details on the forward forming ones, I can give them to you. But uh, So I'm going to focus on a transition that I call AC. As, a, as vehicles are moving into the congested regime, and then they're moving out of the congested regime in what I call CD. So you can see that this uh, forward moving transition here uh, takes a very short time period. So again, time-space diagram. Think about the vehicles entering the system. This is the detector. This is our one mile section. This is the backward moving transition. So the traffic over here is freely flowing, so their trajectories are steep at the higher speed. And then when they hit that transition, they decelerate and are traveling at a slower speed. So this uh, detector is measuring free flow conditions all the way until this time when the congestion signal is uh, received by this detector. So in this example, I'm assuming that we're taking a measurement from a detector at the middle and extrapolating it over symmetrically over the whole section. And we, I'll show an example briefly where we tried a different version. So the vehicle entering just before that signal thinks it's going to have a green light all the way through this section and travel at the free flow speed all the way, as shown by the green line. Um, it's going to think that all of the traffic, so our system will think that all the traffic in the green is traveling at um, free flow speed. So if we, we compute, the, the main metric that we use here are the vehicle hours traveled. So if we compute the vehicle hours traveled for whatever number of vehicles is, is passing through there, we take their travel time and multiply that together. In actuality, so the vehicle right after that signal 
sees that the section is congested and thinks that it's going to be experiencing a congested travel time. And so the system thinks that the whole uh, section in this red area is congested. In actuality, the, that vehicle's travel time uh, or trajectory and therefore travel time will look something like this. And uh, for that first vehicle, we're going to be under predicting their travel time. And for that next vehicle, we're going to be over predicting their travel time. And these distances here are the magnitudes of that over and under prediction. So as I color code here, all of the vehicle hours traveled in the green area are at the uncongested speed, and all of the vehicle hours traveled on the red area are at the congested speed. So I can say that's the actual uh, vehicle hours traveled, and I can compare that to what I had earlier, this one, for the um, predicted vehicle hours traveled. So the basic comparison that I make for different numbers of detectors in this section are the actual VHT, or vehicle hours traveled, and the predicted VHT. And we see what effect more detectors has on, on that. So this just illustrates, well, what if you did add another detector? So the idea was we took a one-mile section and we put two detectors. Um, so we spaced them uh, in such a way that, they are, um, that their influence area is the same. And then if we add three detectors, we do the same thing, four and on up to 10. We didn't, uh, we didn't think that um, more than 10 detectors a mile per mile was reasonable. Um, that would be one detector about every 500 feet. Okay, so this, we refer to the spacing as S. So in, in, uh, in our spacing, we run from one mile to one-tenth of a mile. And so we're going to look at the predicted and actual uh, vehicle hours traveled. And so the actual vehicle hours, tra hours traveled doesn't change, but the predicted does. So it shows that the actual and predicted um, uh, are the same at about a sensor spacing of 0.9 miles. This shows the percent error in VHT. Um, and the, in the absolute value, so what we did, we did a couple little variations on, on this issue of error. Um, we took the absolute value of overprediction and underprediction because I someone said that they thought that um, underprediction was worse than overprediction. And you want to say why, with the microphone? Yeah. Where were we? I'm sorry. Underprediction worse than overprediction. So. If, if we're predicting that the time is going to take longer than it actually takes, uh -huh. that, in my mind, would be better than predicting <clears throat> the opposite of that, in the sense that if you're, as a consumer, um, if you're trying to get someplace at, by a certain time, mm -hmm. obviously there are repercussions if you're late. But if you're early, well, then you've got time to maybe relax, get a cup of coffee. It's a bonus. Yeah, it's about How much worse? Do you have an idea how much worse it would be? How much worse it would yeah, be? Yeah, 10 I times worse, a, two absolutely. times worse. Well, I would, I, I don't like being late personally, so. Oh, well, you didn't, I should have given you the answer in advance, but we assumed that it was three times worse uh, to have your travel time underpredicted than overpredicted. So people don't, in this country, pay for travel time information very often, but our idea was that if, if you, um, thought you were going to be on time, but you were really late, that was worse. So we, we stuck in a penalty, and so this orange line plots the percent error with a penalty assigned to the um, overprediction, uh, the underprediction. So that's why there are three different uh, versions of the error uh, plot. So the absolute value takes the VHT error, overprediction and underprediction, just, just takes the absolute value, and the uh, Additive one doesn't make too much sense, but it, it sums the, the underprediction and overprediction, um, so the positive could cancel out the negative. And then the orange line shows that uh, if we apply a, a penalty factor of three to the underprediction, um, you can see that, th that it shows a higher um, 
yeah, proportionally higher percent error, 25 percent error with one mile sensor spacing. And if you put all that together, uh, those some of those lines, so the actual and predicted VHT intersect at a little over 0.8 miles, and the uh, predicted uh, VHT intersects with the penalty error line at a little under 0.6 miles. So somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8 miles for this uh, little exercise, just considering this transition from uncongested to congested, kind of gives you a reasonable balance of knowing that sometimes you're going to be over-predicting, sometimes you're going to be under-predicting, and you're, you don't have detectors every 500 feet. So it seems to be a reasonable spacing. So I'm going to look at, I'm not going to spend as much time describing this other transition, but basically we did the same thing from the congested, from the transition from congested to uncongested. So you have the actual VHT and the predicted VHT and um, the errors and in this case, for, for this particular transition, the sensor spacing that um, basically balances the under and over prediction between 0.4 and about 0.8 miles. So somewhere in that zone seems to be reasonable. Um, now just if we said, let's forget about over prediction, we're not going to worry about it. We're only going to base our system on under prediction. Um, this is what the uh, actual and predicted VHT would look like based on sensor spacing. So obviously the, you do a lot better with uh, very low sensor spacing. Um, if you look at the error in under prediction, you actually have a minimum at about 0.5 miles. So the, the lesson that we were learning uh, as we were going through this is that around 0.5 miles for sensor spacing seems to be about right. And this just repeats for um, both transitions. Um, again, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 miles seems to be reasonable. Um, by the way, the detector spacing average here in Portland is about 2.4 miles, so um, we could accomplish a lot if we had unlimited resources to go stick detectors out there to uh, get us to 0.5 miles, or we think the more intelligent thing to do is to pick specific locations that we know experience recurrent congestion um, and stick detectors there. And we're actually hoping to conduct some experiments where we might go place some temporary detectors uh, in place for a week or so and then try to actually optimize before we place permanent detectors. So we're actually trying to do uh, kind of an experiment-based um, expansion of the detector infrastructure. Just a quick word about what happens. Um, so one of our reviewers said, well, why are you assuming the detectors are in the middle of every segment? And we said, well, typically that's how this is done. Travel time is, is calculated over a section with a detector in the middle. And so they, they said, well, you could just shift everything and put the detectors at the end of the section. And of course, you could do that, and so uh, we just wanted to prove to them that we weren't stupid and that we knew we could do that. <laughs> so if you have the detector at the end of the section, then your lag time uh, is reduced, and that, you know, we, I guess we felt that was obvious, but um, this just shows that if you have a downstream-based system that um, for under-prediction, you could uh, reduce your error quite a bit, and of course, your, the penalty is that your overprediction is going to get worse with the downstream uh, version, um, as shown uh, on the lower right, right hand side. Needless to say, they didn't publish our paper. Um, what's going to happen in the future? I believe that we'll, uh, that as an industry, we're going to continue to make better travel time estimates and travel time forecasts, partially because we'll be um, fusing the fixed data sources that we have, and more and more mobile sources, vehicles, people, cell phones, um, and so on. Um, in the future, we, I believe we will see ubiquitous integrated information about um, transportation and travel. It will be available in your vehicle in a safe and uh, customized and convenient way. You'll have it in your devices. Um, you'll have it on any kind of vehicle or any, uh, any kind of um, routing or decision making that you need to make. It will be available. And I think it won't be, um, 
it will be customizable and you will be able to receive it in ways and at times that are convenient for you and it will allow us to manage the transportation system better in the future. So I'd like to turn to just a couple little uh, perspectives on this seminar series and really when I arrived in Portland uh, almost eight years ago, um, uh, well both Jennifer and I had been students at UC Berkeley and participated in their transportation science seminar that I think started at Berkeley in the 60s by Gordon Newell. And we, he and I had several conversations about it, how he thought it was really an important part of the transportation program. Um, and it is culturally probably still a place where everybody gets together on Friday afternoons in Berkeley. The students make cookies beforehand and they meet in the library, have coffee and cookies, and then go to the seminar, um, which is at 4 o'clock on Fridays. Um, so with that in mind, there had been brown bag uh, transportation gatherings here at PSU before I arrived. But in October of 2000, um, we had the first, so that was actually, I had just arrived in Portland. I gave the first seminar, Benefits of Archived ITS Data Measuring Capacity of Freeway Bottleneck. So I guess it's fitting that I was the first and now I'm the 200th speaker. Um, 200 is quite a lot. We began... Uh, having the seminars uh, down the hall um, in a small conference room. And then in October 2002, we started doing it in um, one of the distance learning rooms, I think uh, upstairs, third floor. And I don't remember when we moved to this room, but we have been streaming them live on the web since October 2002, and there are about 165 of them archived on the web that you can go relive. Um, in October 2007, I didn't really know what a podcast was. Uh, I had heard of them, but I'd never used one or listened to one. But I figured out what they were back last fall, and uh, we figured out a system to convert our videos to MP3s. And so um, we have 30 podcasts now available. And it's funny how things uh, come around, because I heard that somebody at the US Department of Transportation <laughs> heard about this and is very excited about it. So. I'm, and apparently people have been listening to our seminars uh, on their iPods. I think it's an important venue for faculty and student interaction. Even though Fridays are kind of busy, I think it's still working out to be a valuable place for us all to gather. Um, because I know with some of my colleagues, I may not see them throughout the week, but it's good just to know, you know, to, you, know you can quickly uh, talk about two or three different things. You can see students who maybe you haven't seen that week. Um, and I think we're benefiting from very strong involvement of the transportation community. Some, some, someone like Ed Anderson, who's here from ODOT, uh, we really appreciate the support we've gotten from those who have been interested in our seminar series. Uh, this is just, uh, if you op open up iTunes on your PC and you search for Portland State University, this is the only thing that will come up, and there are about 30 seminars uh, in there. And um, yeah, you can enjoy them or tell your friends. Um, so just a few thoughts about the future. I think, I hope that we'll have 200 more seminars. Um, at Berkeley, they're organized by graduate students. So I think uh, one idea is that if we can expand our graduate program, um, maybe this is something that uh, PhD students can organize in the future. The advantage is at Berkeley, when you were given the honor of organizing the seminar, you can invite anyone you wanted. So you could invite people who you wanted to learn something from or someone you thought you might want to get a job from so you could be strategic and um, create kind of the, t the set of, in our case, 10 seminars that suits your interests and your, uh, your area of uh, focus. We, today we're having refreshments for the first time, I think, and uh, so there, this could be more of a social uh, occasion, but I don't think any of us want to organize that part. Uh, a few years ago, we had a couple, a couple students help organize some point-counterpoint almost debates about light rail or something like that. We could certainly do more of that. It's not that we don't believe that those are good, but they're a little bit harder to organize because you need to have the idea and then you need to find the right, the right pair or more of speakers. So we'd be open to more panels or more point-counterpoint. Um, and just other ideas about topics. Um, we're, we are expanding into the air transportation mode. Uh, so our first air transportation seminar will be on May 9th. And there may be other topics we haven't covered. So um, the, if you have ideas or if you know anyone who has ideas, just let us know. 
We're open to your feedback. <laughs> feedback. Um, so some acknowledgments. The travel time work has been done by a number of students. Uh, Kristen Tufte is a colleague uh, who I already mentioned, and some other students uh, are shown here, including Ed Anderson. He worked on the, one of the early projects. Um, and our, our, our colleagues at ODOT, Galen McGill, Jack Marchin, and Dennis Mitchell, as always, are providing the data and the good ideas, the good research questions. I should acknowledge the Distance Learning Center, who's uh, really made this easy for us to, to basically waltz in here on Fridays and uh, at very low cost to us provide this streaming to the world. So that's um, something that we're very thankful for. And my colleagues who are always here, and uh, I didn't put Miguel, but uh, Miguel also. Uh, and these, there are some seminar enthusiasts out there who give us really good feedback and encouragement. And Ryan Gratzer, who has also uh, prepared the podcast and all the website stuff uh, in recent months. So I really appreciate that. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Is that real? <laughs> it is. <laughs> It looks like it, yeah. So is there is there much information out there that suggests that people actually change their child behavior as a result of being this information? There's not very much information about that, but that is something very important. And there uh, we're actually starting a project um, with colleagues in Minnesota to look at that issue. There's some there's a little bit people have tried to get at that question, um, but there needs to be more research. Uh -huh. Do you use speed limit or something else? Uh, well, th in, in our little model, the assumption was 60 miles per hour, so we actually use a little bit lower than the speed limit, but you could use whatever you wanted. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about um, the use of this for congestion pricing. It seems like it would be a really good fit, um, but also what sort of cost, you know, when you mentioned I think that Portland has um, sensors about every, you said, I think two and a half miles, but yeah. the optimum being uh, 0.5, what sort of costs that would look like to implement a system like that in Portland? What is the detector space in Kristen? Is it 1.2 miles or I think the average spacing is a little, oops, sorry. I think the average spacing is a little over a mile. Okay. 1.2 miles, I think I remember. Uh, that's probably right. Well, I don't have a cost figure off the top of my head. I mean, to install a detector is not not very expensive, maybe $10,000. But usually these are part of larger multi-million dollar um, communication infrastructure. You know, tens of millions of dollars are usually involved. Um, I think more detection could be installed at relatively low cost, but the question would, you know, those funds are, those projects are competing against other projects, and so you have to make the case that this is valuable. And some of this research is aimed at trying to quantify some of that. But generally, detection is not very costly. Uh, what often happens is the maintenance of the detection and the management of the system to store the data is something that is uh, kind of forgotten about. John? Um, it seems as though most of this research is being done in an academic or sort of public forum. But I was wondering with the the advent of, you know, in-car GPS systems and in-car avoid traffic systems, have private companies started to do more research in travel time, like trying to reduce the, travel time? The quick answer is yes, and it has been the case for many years. So the idea uh, in, the, in the auto industry is that, and in some cases that this is actually available, um, that you have a navigation system and you enter your destination and that navigation system computes your route and includes information about real-time <laughs> situations. So if there is an accident on a bridge, the system will route you on another bridge. Or if there's an accident on a freeway, the system will route you off the freeway and then get you to your destination. And so this has been going on for a long time. That um, is kind of a holy grail of, of, of the transportation world to get real-time information into an, uh, a network routing 
system in your vehicle or even not in your vehicle. Um, I think the question is still open is, is about how well those systems that do exist do work. And one of the challenges here in the United States, because every city is a little bit different, if you wanted to make a product available nationwide, it might not work as well in Miami as it would in Portland or San Francisco uh, or something like that, because there are a lot of variables. What kind of information is available? How well is it maintained? Um, so, that, so auto companies that I'm familiar with, mostly in Japan and Germany, you know, in those countries, it's pretty, they're pretty self-contained. In Japan, there's a nationalized uh, traffic information system done by the federal government, so they have traffic information that's the same all over the whole country. Germany is a lot smaller than, than the United States, so in the cities, they, they're fairly standardized. So it's a big challenge in the U.S. that's not, uh, it's, it's something that a lot of people are paying attention to, public and private. Charles. Thanks, Oprah. Um, given, given that um, with the increase in technology and that most, ve uh, well, not most, but a lot of vehicles coming out today are being, are equipped with GPS and, and, and traffic um, stuff, privacy issues aside, is there any movement towards gathering that uh, data that's just out, you know, that's going to be out there with all these GPSs and uh, GPS units in cars and then trying to consolidate that and maybe, you know, Giving you know instead of having sensors in the in the in the road, now we've got you know uh, now we've got a time sequences that we can we can do the same thing with. Is there any kind of again yes direction in that? yes um, I mentioned this idea of the fusion between the mobile and the fixed sources, and there is a national movement called uh, VII vehicle infrastructure integration, where the idea is that in the future vehicles will be able to talk to one another and occasionally talk to the network when necessary to to trade information, whether it's in information about incidents or hazards or simply travel time, um, that that will be possible. And I believe in November in New York at the ITS World Congress, this is going to all be demonstrated. Bits and pieces of it are together and have been demonstrated in research settings, but their idea is in Manhattan, they're going to demonstrate this in some large, very visible way, like I said, in November. And there are people, groups, industry who would like Congress to fund uh, a lot of research in the VII area, a lot of, and that there are, uh, there's a communication spectrum that already exists in the United States, which is an advantage for us that other countries don't have that would allow the, this kind of uh, inexpensive um, communication to occur. So something, something will happen. I don't, it's hard to just say when and uh, exactly what the pathway will be, but uh, I believe something will happen. As you say, vehicles are much smarter. The new vehicles that are out are much smarter than they were. Many of them have GPS. Many of them already have wireless communications. So it's kind of just plugging the, plugging the pieces of the puzzle together. Yes. Right. There in any data source there is noise and and that kind of stop and go has some effect um, because vehicles that are decelerating and accelerating. But what I didn't really get into is that the data that that we get and that are available for most sensors are aggregated. So you, in our case, we're getting a 20-second average. So that, that type of noise is filtered out uh, for us already. But yeah, noise is an issue. Um, what we're looking for are larger trends. So usually, usually we can, can sift those out uh, fairly easily. Hi, uh, John Fisher. Student. Uh, you touched on it briefly, but uh, what are the uh, other models uh, used throughout the world, and uh, how accurate uh, are our models compared to, uh, let's say, Tokyo, where they have uh, maps and they show you red areas, mm -hmm. you know, highly congested, or if there's construction going on in certain areas, and 
what, what, yeah. what, what kind of uh, models are we looking for? Well, in other countries, the, the provision of traveler information is, I would say, much more innovative than it is here. Other countries have experimented with a lot more different um, tools. The idea in the U.S. is that things are fairly standardized. So you saw on the first slide all those rectangular variable message signs. That's really all we've got. There, the, uh, in, in European countries, like you said, you see a map on a board and it highlights the colors. If you have alternate routes, it's very clear. If, if it's green, go green. Um, I don't know of any plans to implement anything like that in the U.S., although many people have talked about it. And I would think if, if the right place arose and if some state wanted to implement something like that, they could propose it and it would have to be approved by the FHWA. But maybe as more people are seeing what's going on in other countries, they'll, they'll take those ideas and try to apply them where they make sense here, maybe as part of a research project. But generally, this, this uh, uh, rectangular text-based system is, is all we've got. Alex? This kind of relates to the rebounding question, but all those variable message signs on the freeway seem pretty expensive to put them in the mm -hmm. It's a good question. Maybe we should have Ed Anderson answer that. No, I, I won't put you on the spot. But variable message signs are used for traffic management and also emergency, uh, um, emergency preparedness. So traffic, inf I was focusing on travel time, but variable message signs in general are used for all kinds of traffic information, incidents, accidents, weather issues, um, amber alerts. Um, they can be used as a public communication tool in the case of any kind of emergency. And usually they're placed at, at strategic locations where people need information, perhaps about an alternate route. So just advance of a decision point, if you have two options, it, they can be placed at uh, that opportune location to give you information about that to improve that decision. Um, generally, they're thought of as a fairly standard traffic management tool. Um, and there are a lot of them ar around. The perception was for a while from the, the federal government that they weren't being used, which is why the FHWA has been encouraging states to display travel time information on them when they're not being used for uh, incidents or uh, emergencies or things like that. So the idea is to get them more into everyday use, and I think that as you get more and they become more part of the system, then they can actually be used more effectively. So at some point there's a critical mass of some number that you need. Did I miss anything? Ed? The one thing I would say is we, we, our philosophy is to limit use so that when there is a message, people will take notice. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research that you know, people do ignore a lot of science. And with the cost involved, we want to make sure our best yeah, the, the idea there is you get desensitized to the communication of some information in general. So if it always says something, you're going to assume, oh, it's always saying have a nice day, so I'm not going to look at it when, when you might need that particular kind of information. Actually, uh, I'm gonna, we've got a few questions on the web that relate to the discussion. I'm going to sort of combine them. One person was asking, Well, I think the answer to the first question is yes. We may not have direct measurable evidence of that, but if you're giving people information to make good decisions, then they're going to make good decisions. And they're not going to, in terms of safety, if you have a, um, an incident or something or a um, congested area and people are able to avoid it because they have good information, um, they can reduce their exposure to um, crash-causing stop-and-go conditions. So that the idea of the, the connection to safety is that if you keep the system moving by giving people good information, um, the, the stop-and-go traffic will be reduced. Well, I think with that, um, can you remind me who's speaking next week? Uh, next week we have uh, Professor Tony Ruffalo. Thank you. Uh,
Fantastic. Well, thank you all for your attention and let us adjourn to the refreshments just outside. <laughs>